1 Corinthians chapter 12. It is interesting that the church in Corinth Paul declared did not come behind in any spiritual gift. And yet in the church in Corinth there were many problems and some of them involved the use of the gifts of the Spirit. And so in chapters 12, 13, and 14 Paul is going to write to them about the gifts of the Spirit and their proper use in the church, warning them against the abuses that existed there in the church in Corinth. And so here we have the biblical teaching on the gifts of the Spirit and their proper use. So he opens the chapter by saying, Now concerning spirituals, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You notice the word gifts is in italics, and it means it was added there by the translators. Uh, it comes further down in the text, but in the original writings, uh, it did not exist there in the first verse, but they put the word gifts to give you an understanding of the issues that Paul is going to be talking about. Talking about spiritual gifts, I would not have you to be ignorant. There was a lot of ignorance in the church of Corinth, even as there is a lot of ignorance in the church today concerning the proper use of the gifts of the Spirit. And so as we look at Paul's instruction, we will come to a proper understanding of how the gifts are intended by God to be used in the life of the believer and in the church. Paul said, first of all, you know that you were Gentiles or you were pagans and you were carried away unto these dumb idols even as you were led. At one time you were living in the flesh. You were without God and without Christ. You were without the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was dead. You were pagans. You were worshiping idols. And that was at one time. Now you've come into a new life, a life of the Spirit. And this life of the Spirit is a total new life. Paul said to the Ephesians, And you, as he made alive, that is spiritually, who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so you were once pagans, living in the flesh and after the flesh, and all you knew was the life of the flesh. But now you've been born by the Spirit, and you've come into this spiritual life. So concerning the spirituals, and that could be gifts of the spiritual life, I don't want you to be ignorant what it is to live in the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit. You were once led by your passions as a pagan following after the pagan gods. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Now, there are rumors, none of them verified. It always happened that someone heard of someone who heard of an experience where someone had uh, you know, and it's so far removed that you never can trace it. But supposedly there was a service where some person got up and spoke in tongues and uh, someone was there that understood the language and they were saying 
horribly blasphemous things as they were speaking in tongues. That, that's a rumor that's been existent since the time of the church of Corinth. Uh, some of these rumors have uh, ancient roots. And so Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said that no man speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus accursed. Not so. Impossible. Uh, a lot of times these rumors are spread to discourage people from the gifts of the Spirit, especially the gift of tongues. Since that you don't understand what you're saying, they suggest that you might be possessed by some evil spirit and as you're speaking in tongues, you're actually blaspheming Christ. Let me just say, those who say such things are close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Jesus said concerning our Heavenly Father that if we earthly fathers have a child that comes to us and he asks us for bread, we're not going to, for bread, give him a stone. If he asks for a fish, we're not going to give him a scorpion. If he asks for an egg, we're not going to give him a serpent. And he said, if you, being earthly fathers, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? If you're seeking God for the fullness of the Spirit in your life, you do not have to worry about some kind of spurious experience that Satan will come and take over because you're opening your heart to God. That is a blasphemous concept of God. You earthly fathers wouldn't do that to your children. How much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? So no man speaking by the Spirit can call Jesus accursed in the same token. No man can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The confession that Jesus Christ is Lord is a confession that we are brought to by the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that convicts us of our sinful state. It is the Spirit of God that points us to Jesus Christ as the only answer for our sin. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord, it is by the Holy Spirit that we declare Jesus Christ is Lord. You cannot truly declare that except by the work of the Holy Spirit within your heart and within your life. Now, there are diversities of gifts, and here the word gifts is used in the Greek, but it is the same Spirit. Paul is going to list for us in a moment some of the diversities of gifts, not a complete list. In Romans chapter 12, Paul gives us a further listing of some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Down at the end of chapter 12, there will be a further listing of gifts that aren't listed in the first nine that he gives us in the first part of the chapter. So there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit, the unity. And in this chapter, Paul is going to stress the unity of the body of Christ. Though there are diversities of gifts, it is one spirit. There are diversities of administrations, but it is the same Lord. Uh, now, there are the gifts of the Spirit, which we will be dealing with, and then there are administrative gifts that Paul will deal with at the end of the chapter, and he deals more fully in Romans chapter 12 with the administrative gifts within the body of Christ. And there are diversities of these administrations, these gifts of administrations, but there is the same Lord, the same Spirit the same Lord. Now there are diversities of operations, but the same God which works all in all. So the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God, you have the Trinity here uh, in the operation of the gifts. And there are diversities of operations. Now, here's the interesting thing.
several people may have a similar gift of the Spirit, but it operates in different people in different ways. It doesn't follow always the same pattern. In other words, the gift of the Spirit may operate in my life in one way. The same gift may operate in your life in another way. The gift of prophecy. The Lord plants in my mind the thoughts, the ideas, and I express them. But I have them first implanted in my mind by the Spirit. That's the way the gift of prophecy operates in my life. You may have the gift of prophecy, but it may operate differently in your life. It doesn't have to operate in your life like it operates in my life. We make a great mistake in trying to pattern God. It's always, it seems, we're attempting to reduce God to a formula. And, and we want, you know, well, how did it happen to you? And uh, what did it feel like? And what, you know, did you think? And where were you? Well, I was lying under the piano when I was filled with the Spirit, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, think, well, i got to be lying down under the pew someplace or under the piano. Uh, and, and we try to uh, pattern. Uh, now, the Bible says if there is any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And so many times we've been called out to pray for the sick. And sometimes God heals them instantly. Sometimes the healing is a process. And sometimes they die. And uh, differences of operations. I remember being called uh, to pray for uh, this little girl who was uh, very sick, had an extremely high temperature. And so some of the elders went with me over to the home uh, and we prayed for this little girl, laid hands on her. I had my hand on her forehead. And as we were praying that God would heal her, as I laid my hand on her forehead, I felt her hot, hot little forehead. But as we were praying, I felt the fever just leave. It just left. And by the time we were through with our prayer, it was, her forehead was cool. And she was instantly healed. Now, I thought, now just how did I lay my, what did I say? Ooh, you know. It worked. What did I do, you know? <laughs> We're so anxious to get it formalized so that, you know, we can do it again. Uh, but it doesn't always happen that way. There are diversities of operations. People react and respond to the Spirit in different ways. Uh, we can have different feelings, different sensations. When Dr. Finney received the empowering of the Holy Spirit in his life. He said he, it felt like there were liquid waves of love just flowing over him, overwhelming him. Uh, he was just engulfed in these liquid waves of love, just one after another, just flowing over him. And he said he finally had to say, Oh, Lord, I can't handle it anymore. You're going to have to stop. I, I just can't handle anymore. And he said, he, and so we say, oh, liquid ways of love, that sounds great, you know. Lord, give me the liquid ways of love, you know. <laughs> because we're trying to formalize the way the Spirit works. But there are diversities of operations. And you can see it through the book of Acts. As they received the Holy Spirit through the book of Acts, there were no two cases that were identical. There was a variety 
in each case. Sometimes it was while uh, they were just praying together that the Holy Spirit came upon them. Later on, while James and, or Peter and John laid their hands on the people, the apostles laying their hands on the people, they received the Holy Spirit. With the case of Paul, it was a disciple in uh, Damascus that laid his hands on Paul. In the house of Cornelius, while, people, while Peter was just preaching, the Holy Spirit came on them. With the church in Ephesus, Paul laid his hands on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. It was always different because there are diversities of operations. So we don't try to formulate and regulate how the Spirit might work in an individual's life, nor do we look to have a copy of someone else's experience. So diversities of operations, but it's the same God who is working all and in all. But the manifestations of the Spirit are given to every man to profit with all. God doesn't give people gifts of the Spirit for their own personal profit. And it is absolutely wrong to seek to personally profit over the gifts of the Spirit. And this is a trap that many have fallen into. When God moves in your heart and moves through your life to touch someone else, oftentimes they're extremely grateful. God has touched, God has healed, God has worked. And, and they're so grateful because you were the instrument that God used in touching their lives that they, they want to respond. We had a fellow come in, very wealthy man. His son was strung out on drugs. He had come to Calvary Chapel. He had accepted the Lord. And his life was transformed. He incidentally is now one of the Calvary Chapel pastors. But his father was so grateful. They didn't know what to do with this boy. He was strung out on drugs. Just his life was a total mess. They didn't know what to do. They had sort of given up. And when he came and he received Christ, his life was so transformed. The father was so grateful. He came into my office and he sat down and he took out his checkbook and he says, How much do you want? And I said, I don't want anything. Well, how much do you need? Every church has a need. I said, we don't need anything. Uh, and he couldn't understand that. But that, that is the response that people have when they have had a work of God in their life. They, they want to respond to it. But the gifts aren't for personal profit. The use and the exercises of the gifts of the Spirit are for the whole church to profit by it and, and not for an individual's profit. And so the profit is to be to all of the church. And uh, that is the purpose of the gifts, that the whole church might be profited by the exercise of those gifts within the body of Christ, the profit of all. Now, to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. In the book of Acts, chapter 15, there developed a problem in the Gentile church of Antioch because there were certain brethren who came to the church in Antioch to spy out their liberty in Christ. And they began to create division in the church there because they being from the Jewish traditional background felt that a Gentile could not be saved. And so they told these Gentile believers, you are not really saved. You can't be saved unless you have been circumcised and you keep the law of Moses. So 
Paul heard about the thing that these fellows were teaching and he got hold of them. And he said, where in the world did you get this? And they said, we've come with the authority of the church in Jerusalem. Paul said, well, let's go back to the church in Jerusalem. Let's get this thing settled right now. You're causing a division in the body of Christ here. So Paul took some of the brethren from the church in Antioch and took these Jews back to the church in Jerusalem. They called the first church council in Acts 15 to determine whether or not the Gentiles should be required to keep the law of Moses and to uh, follow the traditions in order to be saved. That is, do they have to become a Jew in order to be saved? And so as the church body gathered to deal with the issue, Peter, first of all, shared how God called him to the Gentiles. Then Paul and Barnabas shared of the marvelous miracles of the working of the Holy Spirit among the Gentiles. And then we read that James said unto them, My sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things that are strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city those that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So it pleased the apostles and the elders with the whole church. In other words, James came up with the right answer. Let's just write to them and welcome them as brothers in Christ and just suggest that they not commit fornication and uh, they abstain from idolatry and uh, from um, the things that have been strangled and from blood. And if they do that, they do well. And, and everyone was satisfied. The, the issue was solved. And, and that was the word of wisdom that God gave to James because the result, it, it solved the, the difficult uh, problem that had developed. Of course, in the Old Testament, we find the word of wisdom. Uh, Solomon gifted with the words of wisdom and the examples of, of, of Solomon's wisdom. Um, when I was a young pastor, just the second church that I had pa was pastoring in my early 20s, um, we had an annual church picnic. Uh, we were living in Tucson, and on the 4th of July, we had our 4th of July picnic up at Mount Lemmon. It's up some 6,000 feet. You get out of the desert heat up into the cool mountains, and it's a great 4th of July picnic. Well, the uh, Arizona State had a lovely park up there with facilities and uh, tables and, you know, the restroom facilities and all, and running water, and it was an ideal place for a picnic, even room to play ball. So, uh, we had some people, though, that had come into the church, and they happened to own a lot uh, up at the top of the mountain. And uh, it was a little difficult to get to. Uh, you had to go about a mile on a dirt road. But they felt it would be an ideal place for a Fourth of July picnic. But there were no facilities. There was no, no water, no tables. Uh, but they thought that we could just have a prayer meeting. I mean, why do we have to have a picnic? We could just have a prayer meeting. And uh, it would be great for the church to just go up to this lot and, and just pray. So uh, they talked to some people and, and, you know, talked up the idea. Of, well, why don't we go up the top of the hill and just have a prayer meeting? And, and others are saying, well, no way. I'm not going to take kids up to that dirty place. No place to wash their hands. They have to go to the bathroom. And, then, and so it was, there was a division. And of course, how can you say, no, we don't want to pray on the 4th of July? I mean, you can't, you know, you can't put down prayer. And, and so here you are, you know, with the super spirituals wanting the prayer meeting and the practical people just wanting a picnic. And so it became such an issue that those that wanted the prayer meeting said, well, if you go to the public park, we're not going. And... The others were saying, well, if you go to that lot, we're not going. So church is divided. So 
Pastor, where are we going to have our picnic? And boy, you need at that point the gift of the word of wisdom. And, and I knew that, you know, you're in a catch-22. Either answer is going to develop a certain amount of animosity against you. So I said, well, let's let the church board decide that. <laughs> and so the church board wisely decided to go to the state park. We had a great picnic. But these people that were, you know, upset over that, I was able to say, well, you know, the church board decided and, you know, God has probably given them wisdom and so let's just flow with it, you know, and walk in love. You know? <laughs> in... The book of Genesis, we find the word of wisdom given to Joseph. The Pharaoh said, who is wiser than you? Of course, Solomon prayed, God, give me wisdom. And God said, I have given you wisdom. Then there is the word of knowledge. Now, wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. There are people who are very knowledgeable, but they're not very smart. That is, they don't have much wisdom. Solomon said, with all of your understanding, get wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing, he said. Uh, the knowledge without wisdom can be dangerous. And, and this is what we have today. There are a lot of people extremely knowledgeable, but they're not very wise. And so uh, we have the word of knowledge. Now this is knowing things supernaturally, things that you would not have known by natural deduction, but just revelation of the Spirit. In the early church, there developed a sort of early movement that the believers in showing their total dedication to the Lord and because they were expecting Jesus to come back immediately many of them sold their possessions and they brought the money and placed it at the apostles feet and um then the church made distribution to all of those who were in need. And there was a certain couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who sold their possession. And they brought a portion of the money, not all of it. But they were acting like they were giving it all. And so when Ananias came in and laid the money at Peter's feet. He said, is that how much you sold it for? He said, yep. And Peter said, why has Satan deceived your heart to lie against the Holy Spirit? You haven't lied to man, you've lied to God. And uh, now Peter would have no way of knowing that except by the Holy Spirit. It was the word of knowledge as he was declaring the truth to Ananias. And, and by the word of knowledge, he uh, realized that Ananias was in, in hypocrisy, pretending to give everything when he was actually holding back some. Proverbs tells us, For the Lord gives wisdom, and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Now, One is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom, to another, the word of knowledge, same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit. 
In Acts, the third chapter, we find Peter and John were going into the temple at the hour of prayer. There was a lame man, about 40 years old, who was daily brought by friends, and he was placed next to the gate called Beautiful, which was near Solomon's porch. And he would beg alms from the people going in to worship God. And so as Peter and John were passing by, as they were entering the temple to pray, the man sought alms from them, and Peter said, Look at us. And the man turned, expecting to receive something. And Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have I will give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand to your feet and walk. And Peter lifted him up to his feet, and immediately he was healed. He received strength. He began to walk and jump and praise God. And the people around, they saw him walking and jumping up and down, and they said, isn't that the lame man? And others said, it sure looks like him. How is it that he's walking? We don't know. And then he began to grab and hug Peter, and people began to relate the miracle to Peter. And so as they began to look at Peter as though he was really some super saint, he said, ye men of Israel, hold on a minute. Why do you marvel at this or why do you look on us as though we through our own righteousness or good deeds have done this good work to this lame man? Be it known unto you that it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that he is walking. And it is through faith in his name that he's been made whole. For it is the faith which is by him. So Peter is saying it really wasn't my faith. He gave me the faith. It was the gift of faith in operation. The Lord gave to Peter at that moment the faith. And that is the gift of faith. Now, there are times when God just gives you the faith to do something. It doesn't always come. But there are times when you just have the faith. It's going to happen. It's going to... God's going to work, and, and he gives you that gift of faith. You can't work it up. We, we try so hard to work up faith. You can't. It's a gift, and, and it isn't always there. It, it, but in particular circumstances and all, it is there. Uh, several years ago when we were in the little chapel over on Sunflower and Greenville, after a morning service, some kids wheeled their grandfather up to, I was standing in the front, and they wheeled their grandfather up to me, and they said, uh, he was in a wheelchair, and they said, Chuck, would you pray for our granddad? I said, sure, and so I laid hands on him, and I had just read Acts 3, Peter lifted the guy to the feet, so I prayed for him, and I uh, thought, well, why don't I lift him to his feet? I mean, Peter did it. And, and so I lifted the guy out of the wheelchair on his feet. I said, in the name of Jesus, walk. And the guy started walking. And the kids were doing cartwheels almost. I mean, they were so excited. Grandpa's walking. And he walked up and down the aisle. And, and then the kids told me, he had a cold. We wanted you to pray for his cold, you know. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> now, I don't know where I got that faith. I, I don't lift people out of wheelchairs. I don't make a practice out of that at all. But it was just at that instant, it was just, I had the faith that this man can be healed. And it was the gift of faith in operation. Now, the following Wednesday night, we had gone down to Tucson to have Thanksgiving with our relatives there. And I spoke in the church in Tucson. I had pastored it years earlier. And so they asked me to speak that Wednesday night for the Thanksgiving service. And after the service, a man came up. His wife was in a wheelchair. He was pushing her in the wheelchair. 
And he said, Chuck, my wife has had a stroke. Would you pray that God would heal her? And so I prayed, laid hands on her and prayed that God would heal her. And then I patted her on the shoulder and said, God bless you, sister. We'll continue to pray for you. And as he wheeled her out, my son Chuck Jr. said, hey, Dad, how come you didn't lift her out like you did that guy last Sunday? <laughs> and I said, the Lord didn't give me the faith for that. I mean, I didn't feel impressed. I, I, I didn't have any, you know, impulses to, to lift her out. The Lord didn't give me the faith for it. So it, it's something that is one of those intangibles. Sometimes you have the faith, other times you don't. It's a gift of faith. And the fact that it is a gift of faith is manifested in that you sometimes have it and you sometimes don't. It's not a reservoir. It's not something that's just there and, hey, I've got it, man, and any time you want something, just come along and I'll, you know. <laughs> it's not that way. It's just... It comes, it's a gift when it's there, but it isn't a reservoir. Even as the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, it isn't that I have this great reservoir of knowledge, just ask me anything I'll be glad to share with you. No? Uh, or any problem, just come to me, I've got the answer. It doesn't work that way. Sometimes it, it, it's there, sometimes it isn't. It's not just a reservoir. It's something that the Spirit maintains the control of. He gives to you at the moment what you need for that moment. And <laughs> in the ministry of the word, the gift of word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and prophecy is often exercised. And as I am teaching, I often am using the gift of word of wisdom or word of knowledge or using the gift of uh, prophecy. And when the anointing of the Spirit is there, the gifts are in operation, hey, it's great. But every once in a while, the Lord pulls the plug just so you don't get puffed up and think, man, I've got it, I know how, I can do it, you know. And, and he'll pull the plug in. I mean, it is a push. It is, I would be better off just to close the Bible and say, well, folks, be in prayer. Next week, maybe something will happen, you know. <laughs> it's exciting when God is working. Now, oftentimes, as we are speaking, we'll use an illustration and a thought will come into my mind, an illustration to the truth. And I'll, and I'll paint this picture to illustrate the truth. And uh, it is often as these thoughts come, and, and I use it as an illustration that it is not, I don't, I don't get a buzz and a word of wisdom coming, you know. It doesn't work that way. I just, you know, idea, thought, you know, and you just express it. And then later on you find out, that it was the word of wisdom and we've had people that have brought friends to the church and and as we were talking we were laying out their friends situation so graphically that they weren't friends anymore <laughs> I mean they went away angry they said it was wrong of you to call the pastor and tell him about us before we came you know and, and Paul said, if, you know, you're exercising prophecy, the secrets of men's hearts will be revealed. They'll know that God is in you of a truth. One night as we were speaking, of course, our services are broadcast live on radio and throughout the area. And we were in 2 Peter. And he was talking about the false prophets who through feigned words will make merchandise of the people. And we started talking about paper missionaries, ministries that are not ministries, uh, false and fake ministries, people who send out the computerized letters to their mailing list, and uh, they live off of the mailing list, and uh, they send out these pleas through the mail, and, uh, you know, 
the monthly support. There's always that return envelope and, uh, and the whole thing. And these letters each month that give these, uh, you know, uh, things that they are needing and, you know, what God is doing and the glorious work. But, you know, please send your money and keep this work going. God's broken. He's going to be in bankrupt court next week if you don't respond today, you know. And help us out of this desperate situation. And, and, and they live off of that. They, they know the buttons to push. And they have their mailing list. And they live off the mailing list. And, and I, I, I was saying that's a sign of a false prophet. They're using feigned words. What they're saying isn't really true. They're feigned words. They're fake. They're giving fake stories. Fake illustrations. In, in, in Goroka... Um, New Guinea, a beautiful place to live. Uh, and, and there's a paper missionary there. And he has a mailing list back here in the States, and he's got a lovely home, got servants, and, and he, he doesn't do anything but just enjoy life. He's retired, so to speak. Uh, he does go out once a month to the uh, villages, and he'll take a lot of candy and... Uh, when he comes in, he hunks his horn, and all the kids know it, and they come running up, you know, to, he tosses the candy out to him, and they come running up, you know, to the truck, and he snaps pictures. Here are the kids reaching out for their Bibles, you know, and uh, tells about all the work, and people support him, and he's a paper missionary. He's, he's a phony. And I said, here are these guys. They, they live down on Lido Island. They drive white Cadillac convertibles, and, uh, you know, they live a life hive style, and, you know, the suede shoes and so forth, and they have their mailing list. And I said, they don't have a true ministry, but they're just living off the mailing list. The next morning, the secretary said, uh, Chuck, you got a fellow on the phone insisting to talk to you. He sounds really mad. And uh, I said, well, put him through. And uh, so he said, I want you to know I have a true ministry. I said, what? He said, my ministry is a genuine ministry, and I don't appreciate you telling all the people that it's a false ministry. I said, who are you? He said, you know I live down on Lido Island. I have a white Cadillac convertible and all. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was just making that up. I don't know anything about you. I've never heard of you before. But it was the word of knowledge being exercised. It can get you in trouble sometimes. But it, it's, it's the way the gift operates. The gift of faith. Peter said, it wasn't my faith. It was the faith which is of him that this man stands here before you whole. In the 14th chapter of Acts, in, in verses 8 and 9, there was a certain man at Lystra who was lame, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. And the same was listening to Paul speak. And he was steadfastly looking at Paul. And Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed. And he said with a loud voice, Stand on your feet. And he leaped up and walked. And the people saw what Paul had done and they lifted up their voices and they said in the speech of the Lyconians, the gods have come down and they've come, they look like men. But here was Paul and he perceived that this man had the faith. It, it, the, it, he was exercising the discernment of spirits, but he discerned that this guy has faith to be healed. And so he spoke to the man, stand on your feet, walk. And the man did. And so it was the gift of faith. Then there are the gifts of healing. And any time God has touched you and healed you, you have received a gift of healing. I have received many gifts of healing. I believe that God has bless me with excellent health. And in all of the years of ministry, 
I've only missed being in the pulpit once because I wasn't really feeling well. And it was while we were here, we were in triple services. We were in the little church over on Greenville. And I woke up one Sunday morning and I felt just weak and dizzy. I couldn't collect my thoughts. My mind was just in a whirl. So I went down and woke up Chuck Jr. And I said, Chuck, you're going to have to speak for me this morning. So he got up and he went out and he preached the first service. During that first service, no doubt, when they said, well, Chuck is sick, he can't be here for church today, there were so many people started praying for me. As I was lying there in bed, suddenly I felt great. I was healed. So I got up, got dressed, went out to the next two services. <laughs> I was healed instantly. I received a gift of healing. And God does heal. He does heal the sick. And the Bible tells us if there are any sick among us, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer of faith will save the sick. Lord will raise them up. And so on Saturday night, we have the elders back in the uh, back part of the building there in the prayer room praying for the sick. Those that want to come and be anointed with oil and prayed for. Uh, the elders are back there praying for the sick according to the scriptures. And when God touches and heals a person, they've received a gift of healing. And God has done some marvelous healings, cancers and everything else. We've seen God work and heal people. Then there is that working of miracles. And we find examples of that in the book of Acts when Peter prayed for Dorcas and she was raised from the dead. That was a miracle. Uh, we read concerning Paul when uh, he was ministering in Ephesus in the 19th chapter of Acts. Uh, we read there in uh, verse 11 that... Uh, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought to the sick people handkerchiefs or sweatbands and the diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. That was the working of miracles, special miracles by the hands of Paul. Then the gift of prophecy. And again in Acts chapter 21, we read of this prophet by the name of Agabus who was in the church in Jerusalem. And when Paul was there in Caesarea staying with Philip before going up to Jerusalem, uh, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. When he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and he bound his own hands and feet. And he said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle and shall deliver him unto the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they that were of that place begged Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, What do you mean, weeping? You want to break my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, the prophet Agabus. Now, it isn't always foretelling the future. It can just be speaking forth the word of God. And in the Old Testament, when you are speaking for God, it is the gift of prophecy. In the 14th chapter, Paul will teach us a little bit about the gift of prophecy. He that prophesieth, he said, speaks to the church for edification, for exhortation, and for comfort. It's ministry to the body of Christ. God speaking to his people. And, and there are those that just have that gift of speaking forth God's truth to the people, and it's the exercise of the gift of prophecy. And then uh, David said on his dying bed, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Peter acknowledges that David was a prophet. 
And David acknowledges that it was God that spoke by him. It was God's word that was in his tongue. The gift of discerning of spirits. And uh, there in the eighth chapter of Acts, we find an example of that beginning with verse 20. And uh, we read that Philip had gone up to Samaria to preach Christ to them. Many believed and were baptized as they saw the miracles and all that were wrought by Philip. And when the church in Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had received the gospel, they sent unto them Peter and John, because as yet the Holy Spirit had not come upon them. And as Peter and John laid hands on them, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there was a certain man, his name was Simon, he was beforehand a sorcerer, but he also believed when he saw the miracles, and he was baptized. And when he saw that by the laying on of hands the Holy Spirit was imparted, he said to Peter, uh, how much would it cost me? I'd like to buy this gift. I'd like to go around and lay hands on people that they would receive the Holy Spirit too. And Peter began to exercise the gift of discernment of spirits. He said, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Peter was, Peter was seeing what was in his heart. There was down in his heart a, a jealousy. He had lost uh, the, his position of, of a prominent man in the community. They all thought that he was a mighty power of God until they saw the genuine power of God through Philip. And they turned from him and were following now after Jesus Christ. But he was wanting to get some of that attention and glory back. And Peter could see his heart. And he said to him, your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to God if perhaps he might forgive the thoughts of your heart. For I perceive, discern, that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That was the discerning of spirits. He saw what the true heart of the man was. Uh, you, you're in this gall of bitterness. You're in the bond of iniquity. Then there are the diverse kinds of tongues. Now, uh, we find on the day of Pentecost that as they were waiting upon the Lord, suddenly there was a sound from heaven like of a mighty rushing wind filled all the house. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in glossialia, unknown tongues, as the Spirit gave them the ability or prompted their speech. Now, there were devout Jews who had come for the a feast of Pentecost from all over the world. And when this was noised abroad, they gathered together and they said, what does this mean? Because they said, we hear, are not all of these which are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear every one of us in our own language, their declarations of the marvelous works of God? And there were some 17 different language groups that understood the various languages that these people were speaking in. Now, when it talks about their, the languages, those that understand that they're speaking in our dialects, dialectus in the Greek. Uh, the, to the disciples, it was a glossialia. It was an unknown tongue, but to those that had gathered, it was a dialect. They're speaking in our dialects, the wonderful works of God. And then... Lastly, in this particular listing is the gift of the interpretation of tongues. One person speaking in another tongue while another person interprets that which was said by the Holy Spirit, not by natural understanding of what was said. A translation. It's not a translation, it's an interpretation, and it is a gift of the Spirit. Now, interestingly enough, we don't have any example that I know of in the New Testament of the exercise of the gift of the interpretation of tongues, but Paul will talk about it more in chapter 14. But there is one interesting um, example, interestingly enough, in the Old Testament of the interpretation of a tongue, so, so to speak. 
You remember when Belshazzar was having his great feast with a thousand of his lords, and while he was pretty drunk, he ordered the golden vessels that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem that had been sanctified in the worship of God, that they would bring in the golden vessels that they might drink their wine out of these vessels from the temple. And as they were drinking their wine out of these vessels and were praising the gods of gold and silver, suddenly there appeared a hand and it was writing on the plaster of the walls, words that they did not know or understand. And, and so the king immediately said to his wise men, what does that say? And they said, we don't know. And the queen mother said, there was a man from Israel during your grandfather's reign who was able to tell dreams and interpretations and so forth. You call him, he can probably tell you. So they brought Daniel in. He's, he's an old man now. He's probably close to 90. And, and they brought him in and, and he said, you know, tell me what that means and I'll give you this royal coat and I'll do all of these things. And Daniel says, keep your stuff, uh, but I'll tell you what it means. And uh, Daniel said the word many means that God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You're through. The word tekel, you've been weighed in the balances and you've been found wanting. And the word eupharsin or peris, your kingdom is divided and it's going to be given to the Medes and the Persians. So Daniel interpreted these words that were written by God upon the wall. Several years ago, when Calvary Chapel was in a transition state, before we had built the little chapel on the next block, we were meeting in the Lutheran church on Sunday afternoon. And then Sunday evening, we were using the clubhouse over in East Bluff for our meetings. And it was Pentecost Sunday. And so we had our Bible study, and then at the end, of course, just a small group of us, maybe 50 or so at the time. And, and so at the end, uh, we just said, it's Pentecost Sunday, let's just worship the Lord and uh, wait upon God. And it, when we were in those small little intimate type circles, we could, we could do that. I would, you know, answer questions and it would be a time of discussion afterwards and, and, and times of just waiting on in prayer. And so uh, we had one lady in our fellowship who God gave her the gift of tongues. And when she speaks in tongues, she speaks in French. And so uh, I said, you know, Pentecost Sunday, and, and as we worship the Lord, uh, why don't you just go ahead and worship the Lord in it's such a phenomenal thing to hear her speak in French uh, that I said, why don't you just, you know, worship the Lord in, in the tongue that the Lord has given you. And as she began to speak in this language, in French, uh, I could understand some of the French. I have studied Latin, and so it's one of the Romance languages, and you could pick up a word here or there. And I could pick up that she was... Uh, giving thanks for a beautiful song that the Lord had given to her. And I thought, my, that's very appropriate. She used to be a nightclub singer and uh, to thank God for the new song and all that he had put in her heart. Beautiful, you know. But I didn't try to interpret because I intellectually understood. And I didn't want to get my intellect mixed up with the spirit. So I didn't seek to give the interpretation because I, I, I knew that part of it was just my own intellect. But Kay gave the interpretation. And it was beautiful. You know, Lord, you've given me this beautiful new song and uh, the song of love and praise unto you. And I will uh, rejoice in your love and in the songs that you give to me and all. And it was very beautiful. And all of us were blessed. Well, there was a gal there that had been brought that night by a friend. She was from Palm Springs, and she was going through some difficulties, and she was brought uh, so that I could talk to her after the meeting. And so uh, as people were dismissed and started to leave, uh, she came up, and um, she said, 
before we get into my situation, what was going on here? Um, how is it that that lady spoke to the group in French and the other lady uh, translated? <laughs> and I said to her, would you believe that neither of those women know French? And she said, oh, no, I wouldn't believe that. I said, well, that's true. I said, I, I know both of them. One is my wife. And I know that she doesn't know French at all. But this is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And I took her into the scriptures and showed her the gift of tongues and interpretation. I said, that, that is a gift of the Spirit. And what you saw was a gift of the Spirit in operation. And she said, well, she said, she just didn't speak French. She spoke with an aristocratic accent. She said she spoke in the high French. She had an aristocratic accent. I said, well, uh, I would expect that from God. Uh, <laughs> and so she said, well, before we get to my problem, I've got to accept Jesus. I said, well, that'll be the end of your problem, so let's do it. And... Uh, so she accepted the Lord. I mean, she was convinced when she saw the genuine operation of the gift of the Spirit. And it so happened that she had lived in France for five years in Paris. She was very wealthy, came from a Jewish background, and was living in Palm Springs, and had spent five years in France, and uh, knew French very well, and was with the aristocrats there. And uh, yet seeing a genuine demonstration of the gifts in operation, her heart was convinced that this has to be real. I mean, you can't just do that. It's just, it has to be real. So, all of these are by the self-same Spirit who divides to every man severally as he wills. Uh, it may be that he'll give you two or three gifts of the Spirit. It may be that he'll give you more. He divides to each man severally as he wills. But it's the same Spirit, same God, same Lord, the unity, the oneness in the body of Christ. And so Paul naturally bridges from that into the oneness of the body. For as the body is one, body of Christ, and has many members... And all of the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now, here's your body. You have many different members. You've got your fingers, you've got your hands, you've got your uh, wrists, you've got your arms, you've got your head, you've got, hopefully, you've got your feet, you've got your legs. I mean, there, there are all different parts to your body. Now, all of the parts of your body don't fulfill the same function. They each feel, uh, fulfill a separate function, but they're all needed to be a whole person. You need your eyes, you need your nose, you need your ears, you need your mouth. You need all of these things, though they're separate and have a distinct purpose, yet they all work together in the one body. And so we have all of these different gifts within the body of Christ. And different people with different gifts, but it should all work together in unity, and we are all unified in Jesus Christ. Now, we're not talking about just Calvary Chapel. We're talking about the body of Christ in this community, which is comprised of Episcopalians, of Lutherans, of Baptists, of Presbyterians, and, and all of the different groups. It doesn't matter what name they put over their door. If they are following after Jesus Christ, we are all a part of the one body and we don't all fulfill the same function. God has a purpose for each part of the body of Christ. And, and God has these ministries in the area that attract and appeal to different people than Calvary Chapel attracts and appeals to. We are fulfilling our place in the body of Christ, but ours isn't the only. We're only a part of the whole body, and we need to see that. We need to guard against exclusivism, to think that we're it, you know, and we're the whole angel. Not so. We're just a part of God's total ministry in the area, and when one part of the body is exalted, we all should rejoice. 
If God is moving in a church over here and people are being saved and things are really happening, then let's rejoice. Let's not say, well, why did God do it to them and not to us? You know, Let's rejoice that God is working over there and that God is bringing people unto himself. And we need to see that unity of the whole body of Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into the one body. Whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we are bond or free, we've all been made to drink into the one spirit. And oh God, help us to see the unity of the body of Christ. For the body is not one member but many. There are many parts to the body. And thus the foot, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I'm not the body. Is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, Behold, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, it would be rather grotesque, wouldn't it? <laughs> and then where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, then where would, would the smelling be? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. The Holy Spirit divides to each man severally as he wills. He sets us in the body as pleases him. And God gives us the gifts to be used in the body of Christ. But we work together. We are, in, we are interdependent upon each other. To have the whole body, we've got to have all the parts. You can't just sit home alone and say, well, you know... Uh, I'm just going to worship God here at home. I don't need to go to church. I don't need the fellowship. I can just get it right here at home. No, no, no. You're saying I don't need the whole body. You do. You, you are a part of the body. You're not the whole body. No one is the whole body. We're all parts of the body. And there is that interdependency upon one another. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as pleases him. We are here at God's pleasure. We are what we are by God's design and pleasure. If, and if they were all one member, then where were the body? Uh, it, it isn't a body just if it's just one part. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again to the head, to the feet, I don't need you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Every part of your body is necessary for the full functioning of the body. Now, it's important... <laughs> to realize I'm a part of the body. I may not be a very visible or noticeable part, but I am a part of the body and an important part. And though I may not be so visible or prominent, yet I am an important part to the body. I am needed for the whole body to function properly. There are parts of your body that you can't see, but they're surely necessary. Uh, your digestive system, absolutely necessary. Uh, your brain, you can't see it, but it's necessary. Your heart, your lungs, you don't see them, but they're necessary parts of the body. So not every part of the body has a prominent place where everybody sees it. Now, it would be terrible if in our own bodies they, we had the striving that we often have in the body of Christ, where a person isn't satisfied to be what God has made them. What if your own body had that kind of a rebellious attitude towards its place in the body? Your big toe would say, I'm tired of this hot, smelly place. It's always dark and damp. I want people to notice me. I want to be planted in the middle of the forehead where everybody can see me. But you have things like that happening in the body of Christ. And it gets grotesque. We need to be what God has made us. We need to be satisfied where God has placed us, knowing that he's put us here for his purposes. And though we may not draw attention and all, yet important to the whole 
functioning of the body. So those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor and on our uncomely parts the more abundant comeliness. There are those here in the body of Christ that uh, have received the gift of intercessory prayer. And they are by far, Pete, you don't know them. You don't see them. You don't, they don't have badges that say, I'm an intercessor. Uh, and yet, what an important part of the body of Christ. We couldn't function. We wouldn't be functioning as we are. We wouldn't be blessed as we are if it weren't for this part of the body, these people that are fulfilling that place in the body of intercessory prayer. And so each of us have our place within the body. And on those parts that aren't noticed, God has appointed more abundant beauty for our comely parts have no need, but God tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. You're important in the body of Christ and in the eyes of God. And though men may not know of your ministry, it may not be one of those visible ministries, yet God sees and God rewards you for your faithfulness of being what God has called you to be and being that part of the body that you've been called to fulfill. That there should be no schism in the body, that is, this business of wanting to promote myself to the middle of the forehead. Uh, but that the members should have the same care one for another. We're one body. So we have that love and that concern and that care for each other. We are all part of the body. If you're hurting, I hurt. If you're being blessed, I'm being blessed. If you're being honored, I'm being honored. Because we're one body. And so the blessing and the honor that God is bestowing upon Calvary. He's not bestowing upon me. He's bestowing upon the whole body here. We're all being blessed. We're all being honored because of what God is doing by his Holy Spirit. And thus we all rejoice together in the beautiful work of God's Holy Spirit that he's accomplishing in our fellowship here at Calvary Chapel. One member suffers, they all suffer with it. One member is honored, all the members rejoice it. Now, getting back to the big toe. If someone stomps on it, where do you hurt? All over. <laughs> if they break the toe by stomping on it, the whole body's going to be limping for a while. When one member suffers, they all suffer. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Each one of you have your place and function. And God has set some in the church, first of all apostles, and then secondarily prophets, and thirdly teachers. And after that, miracles. Now isn't it interesting, the, the, the order, first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, and then miracles. If we were making out the list, we'd probably put miracles at the top. And then he asked some rhetorical questions. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? No. Does everyone speak with tongues? No. Does everyone interpret? No. We have differing gifts, but the same spirit. We have different operations, but the same God. Different administrations, but the same Lord. There is the unity, and yet the diversity in the unity in the body of Christ. So, Covet earnestly the best gifts. What is or what are the best gifts? 
I don't know. It all depends. I have several saws in my garage. I have a jigsaw. I have a table saw. I have a hacksaw. I have a skill saw. Oh, yes, you bet. <laughs> a sawzall. What's the best saw I have? What do you need to cut? You want to cut a pipe? You better not use my skill saw. <laughs> but I have the hacksaw for that. You want to cut circles in plywood? Can't use my skill saw. But you can use my jigsaw. It all depends on what your ministry is in the body of Christ. What is the best gift? And so God gives us the places in the body and then he gifts us for that place within the body. And so wherever my place is, I need to covet what would be the best gifts in fulfilling that place in the body where God has put me. So being a pastor teacher, that's my ministry in the body, the best gifts are word of wisdom, word of knowledge and prophecy. And I'm blessed because God has given to me these gifts. But they are the gifts that I need, especially for the place in the body that God has called me. Now, covet earnestly the best gifts. The Holy Spirit gives to each man severally as he will. God places us in the body as pleases him. But covet earnestly the best gifts, those gifts that can best equip you for the place in the body where God has called you. But Paul said, yet I will show you a more excellent way. A better way than all of the powers of working miracles or all of these other things. I'll show you a more better way. And next week, we get into that more better way, the higher road path of love. 13th chapter, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible, next week as we continue our study through the scriptures. Father, thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for the body of Christ. Oh, Lord, bring us into an awareness of the unity that you desire within your body that we working together in love might be built up in Christ Jesus. And Lord, that we will have that care and concern for one another so that when one part of the body might be hurting, we will all hurt with them. When one is being honored, we will all rejoice with them. Lord, may we truly be a body that is pleasing to you in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me.